Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be exposing how Hamas use women and children as human shields in the war against Israel. Warm welcome to the program, and uh, my guest today is a good friend of mine and a good friend of the Middle East Report and Revelation TV, uh, Michael McCann from Israel Brin Alliance. Welcome back to the program, Michael. Thank you, Simon. And uh, Michael, can you share with us uh, uh, the success of uh, one of your campaigns, which was to prescribe uh, Hezbollah as a terrorist organisation? Well, if you don't mind, I'll share two, Simon. The Absolutely, first one, go ahead, yeah. The, the first one was a successful banning of Hezbollah in the United Kingdom. Uh, Revelation TV, TV viewers will know that this has been a long-standing campaign every year. We've had effectively two campaigns, one about banning Hezbollah and the second one about taking the Hezbollah flag out of this Al-Quds march and rally, which is held annually uh, in London uh, around about June. Uh, and we kept on highlighting with the government and with ministers and MPs this ridiculous contradiction where the suggestion was being made that the military wing and the political wing of Hezbollah were two separate entities, when in fact they themselves told everyone we have one single command structure for a political wing and for a military wing. So therefore, uh, the arguments that we've been putting forward consistently since 2016, since IBA um, started its campaigns, have been taken to MPs at the front line, right direct into the heart of the House of Commons. And on the 20th, and the and to 25th of January 2018, there was a, a significant debate in the House of Commons, which we uh, were instrumental in creating, uh, which led to an unusual thing in the House of Commons. The backbenches were united in condemning the government's position and highlighting this flaw in the government's uh, policy making. And therefore, uh, this year it was fantastic uh, to see Sadiq. Uh, the, the Sajid Javid, I should say, standing up in the House of Commons as a Home Secretary and finally banning Hezbollah. And the one thing that Revelation TV viewers should know is that all the arguments he used for and his justification for banning Hezbollah were precisely the same arguments that we had put forward in our campaign letters, our emails that we'd sent regularly to government. So thank you to Revelation TV and all your viewers that have helped in that campaign as well. Uh, Simon, the second one was Israel Apartheid Week. You remember this is in a, these are a series of events that take place in university campuses uh, around about the end of February, well into March. Uh, and every year there's 100 plus events that take place around the country using that title Israel Apartheid Week. Now, I have no objection if they won't invite anybody at all to speak on the issues, even if they, the, the narrative they put forward is false. It's up for people to discern what the truth and what the lies are uh, in these matters. Uh, what I do object to is the term Israel Apartheid Week, which suggests Israel is an apartheid state. It's not. And uh, your viewers will again be pleased to know, because of our campaigning, uh, the hundreds of events that usually take place was whittled down to a mere five in 2019. Now, I want to see the whole thing banned, because I don't think they should be allowed to use that banner headline in describing these events. But nonetheless, another great success because of the campaigning that uh, a number of partner organisations do across the UK under the banner of IBA, but crucially because of the support of your viewers at Revelation TV. Fan fantastic. So keep up the good work, and it's uh, fantastic to see that Hezbollah, is, which is a genocidal terrorist organisation, has been prescribed in the UK, and the government's seen sense on that. So well done for that campaign, and also for limiting the power and influence of the whole BDS and the uh, Israel boycott, oh, sorry, Israel apartheid, which, which is absolutely immoral and disgusting. Um, now, the latest campaign that you're talking about is, is really uh, about the use of human shields by Hamas, by uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, and of course this is a, um, a tactic used by Islamic terrorist organisations. But before we discuss the campaign, uh, what do you make of the uh, over 690 uh, rockets and missiles that have fired into Israel uh, over those um, two days back in early May? Utterly despicable. 
utterly despicable because they fire those rockets from behind civilians and behind children. And therefore, when that IDF uh, ret retaliate rightly because they have to defend their population, then they are in danger of putting civilians and children in danger, and they don't want to do that. That's why they take loads of measures to prevent that happening. Um, so you, some people might have, many of your viewers will have heard these terms and not been quite sure about what they meant. Conventional warfare, two armies coming together in battle. Asymmetric warfare, where one side has got a normal army, a British army, the IDF, looking after its civilians and protecting them from harm. Asymmetric warfare, what the terrorists use, the tactics of terrorists use, who don't care if they put children and civilians in danger. That's the difference between the IDF and the forces that they face. They're facing terrorists who don't care and, ha and think that meaning uh, human life is worthless. So let's have a look at this excellent video produced by The Telegraph that looks at Hamas in 60 seconds. And uh, let's not kid ourselves that uh, Hamas is a genocidal terrorist organisation that wants to see Israel's destruction and the annihilation of the Jewish people worldwide. Just have a look at their covenant charter. Um, now, we're discussing Hamas and their use of uh, sh human shields and using uh, women and children deliberately um, in harm's way. Um, can you explain to us why they use asymmetrical warfare and why they put women and children deliberately uh, in danger, including civilians as well? There's a number of different reasons. First of all, they know that they can't take on the IDF on a normal uh, war, conventional warfare if it's known, because they know they'll be wiped out. If they go into a battlefield with the IDF, uh, Hamas is finished, it's over, it's done. And they have an ambition, as you've just mentioned, to wipe out Israel. And that's why when people talk about Hamas and they give this impression that there's a room for negotiation, there is no room for negotiation with Hamas. All they are interested in, as you have said, is the genocide or destruction of Israel. And anyone who suggests otherwise is not telling you the truth. So the reason they then moved to, because if you remember, uh, they lost, before Hamas existed, uh, the, the countries, the Arab countries attacked Israel in 1948, uh, despite the fact that Israel was nascent in its existence, had just become a, a, a self-proclaimed country. Uh, they were attacked by all the Arab armies. Tiny Israel survived. In 1967, when all the Arab armies once again were preparing to attack Israel, Israel in the Six Day War uh, took matters into its own hand to protect its people and they won. And in 1973, in the Yom Kippur War, a conventional war again, the Arab countries lost again. That's when they moved to terrorism, that's when they decided that conventional warfare wasn't working for them. And life is so cheap to these people that they're prepared to use children and civilians as barriers between them and the IDF. And because the IDF are a morally, uh, a moral army who operates to the highest standards, is, is trained to the highest standards, they will not indiscriminately shoot children and civilians. And that's why Hamas use, use asymmetric warfare, because they know they ca the, the, the moral imperatives that, the, that drive the IDF mean that they can continually mount these attacks on Israel with the knowledge that Israel will not retaliate with full force because children and civilians are on the front line.
And also, there's a, the problem explaining Israel's position is the fact that our Western media doesn't help Israel at all, but actually helps Hamas um, by always telling the Hamas narrative, and never do they show reports of, of uh, you know, women and children being used as human shields. Um, this is a tragedy when we actually need to know the truth of the situation, isn't it? Of course, uh, there is a responsibility for uh, media outlets to report fairly. Uh, but they don't do it. It's as simple as that, whether it's the BBC or even Sky News, which tended to be a little bit better. Even Sky News and other outlets are now falling into the Hamas propaganda trap. And, you know, in order to get credentials to report inside places like Gaza, they have to abide by Hamas's rules. And those Hamas rules declare that you won't report anything that we don't like, otherwise we'll kick you right out, or worse still, will happen to you. So, you know, the media play a very, very dangerous game in the way they lopsidedly report uh, efforts uh, or the Hamas efforts to create war with Israel. Uh, but you know, the, the most worrying thing is it's all about money. The latest uh, violence, the latest, latest rocket attacks at, uh, on Israel were all about Qatari money. Hamas were running out of money to spend on all their nefarious terrorist activities. So therefore, they created a war in order to put pressure on the Qataris and Israel to deliver the money to them. That's what it was all about. It wasn't about anything noble about looking after the people. It was about hard cash. And of course, the clip that you showed there showed that the great leader doesn't live in the front line of Gaza. He lives in, in Doha, uh, some distance away from the, the, the people that he places in penury because of the policies of Hamas. Absolutely. Um, Michael, do you want to introduce your new campaign video that uh, you very much want our viewers to get behind and support so that our MPs are fully aware of how Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad are using uh, women and children as human shields. Well, just as frustrated I am about the, uh, the way that the media falsely reports events in Gaza and doesn't report uh, the mendacity of Hamas, I'm equally uh, despairing of the behaviour of many of our members of parliament. Sadly, many of those members of parliament from the party that I used to represent, uh, the Labour Party, and people will know the names well, Jeremy Corbyn. Andrew Slaughter, Richard Burden, Lisa Nandy, Debbie Abrahams, all people who indiscriminately attack the IDF. Now that we've won the war in terms of banning Hezbollah, we can move on to new pastures and we can deal with bigger issues. And this next issue is about the use of human shields um, by Hamas uh, of children and civilians being placed in the front line, being placed in danger. And our politicians uh, so frequently, rather than criticising the people who are creating the bloodshed, criticising uh, Israel when all they are doing is defending their people. So therefore, we want to highlight not only the contradictions and the falsehoods that are put forward by Hamas, but we also want to highlight the huge and uh, moral standards that the IDF operates to, to ensure that civilians and children are protected and they don't put innocent lives in danger. And the campaign is unique because not only are we partnering with all the organisations across the UK that work with us, CUFI, We Believe, Sussex Friends of Israel, North West Friends of Israel, Welsh Friends of Israel, Scottish Friends of Israel, we're partnering for the first time, Simon, with an organisation called My Truth. My Truth is an Israeli organisation made up of active reservists in IDF who tell their stories, the real life testimony about what they've witnessed on the ground. Excellent. So let's have a look at the latest uh, IBA campaign. The Hamas terror group have once again released a barrage of rocket fire against Israel. Their rockets have targeted civilians. A war crime. Hamas is using children and civilians as human shields, putting the lives of their people at risk as they carry out attacks against Israeli civilians. Sadly, politicians are ignoring this war crime and instead prefer only to criticise Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East. This is Graham Morris, a member of the UK Parliament for the Easington constituency in the northeast of England. He is an experienced MP and a prominent, vocal and devoted supporter of the Palestinian cause. On 22nd of April, Easter Monday, he posted a video on Twitter in which he claimed IDF soldiers were beating up children for fun. The footage actually contains film of Guatemalan soldiers abusing children. The video was designed to create the lie that the Israel Defence Forces behave in this way. Mr Morris doesn't stand alone. He's emblematic of a cadre of MPs 
who believe that they have the right to make wild accusations against the IDF, regardless of circumstances they face. Conversely, the same MPs remain stoically silent when terror groups like Hamas use children and civilians as human shields. Worse still, the spread of fake news about IDF conduct misinforms the debate on how we reach a just and lasting peace between Israel and the Palestinians. The IDF is one of the most professional, skilled and ethical fighting forces in the world. Colonel Richard Kemp CBE, a decorated British veteran with 14 operational tours of duty and service on the Joint Intelligence Committee, said this about the IDF's operations on the Gaza border last year. Those who claim the IDF exceeded the necessary use of force in confronting the Gaza violence have failed to recognise the differences from situations faced by Western forces. In my professional opinion, the IDF's rules of engagement are in line both with international law as well as with military standards of other Western militaries. The IDF has had to defend its people from both conventional and asymmetric threats for 70 years. It has done so with distinction. Our campaign seeks to inform and educate British politicians about the truth about the IDF, its activities and the unparalleled code of morals under which its soldiers serve. The truth is so much more compelling than the lies perpetrated by people like Graham Morris. You can contribute to our campaign by contacting your constituency MP now at www.israelbritain.org.uk forward slash truth. And uh, if you want to fight for Israel and uh, protect Israel uh, and make our politicians aware of the challenges that Israel faced, particularly from Hamas, that are a genocidal terrorist organisation, then it's so important that you get involved in their campaign. And uh, Mike, you're also giving out um, a, a booklet, aren't you, on um, human shields and how Hamas use women and children uh, in and put their very lives in danger. Yeah, I've, I've got a booklet that's been issued by uh, the My Truth organisation. It's, it's, it's available as electronic format as well, um, Simon. So if anyone wanted a copy from you, then all they need to do is send a, an email with, uh, and I'll respond to them, to info at israelbritain.org.uk. That's the email address to send it to. That's info at israelbritain.org.uk. And I'll send you a copy of the electronic booklet, which is... Uh, give some f fantastic and fascinating uh, testimony from IDF reservists. One story tells of the circumstances of a, of a riot where the children were placed in front of those who were creating the riot and Molotov cocktails uh, were, were passed up to the front till they got to an individual who was then surrounded by children in order that the IDF uh, wouldn't attack them because they know the IDF won't uh, attack children and civilians. Another gives the example of snipers, Hamas snipers, firing from behind children. You know, with the full knowledge that if they then, if the IDF responds and injures or kills one of the children, then that's a propaganda war uh, for the next day. This is all about propaganda. It's all about depriving the state of Israel the right to defend its borders. It isn't about Gaza, because they know they can't win militarily against Gaza. This is about the International Criminal Court in The Hague and taking Israel to that court in order to prevent it defending its nation and its people. Uh, which is absolutely uh, abhorrent. It's an absolutely evil practice. But why do you think there is enough um, international condemnation from world governments, um, from the EU, from uh, the UN, and also probably you probably get some condemnation from uh, President Trump because he did uh, protect Israel and Israel's right to uh, to defend itself against these rockets and missiles fired by Hamas. But I, I, essentially, he's the exception. But where is the international uh, condemnation and the outcry of the use of uh, human shields by Hamas? Well, let me give a, a glimmer of hope uh, for your viewers, because in the last rocket attacks that you uh, explained took place uh, just a few, a few days ago uh, in terms of the events in Gaza, the situation that we face is that the EU condemned the Hamas rocket attacks. There's a first for you. That is a first. Uh, you know, Donald Trump, yeah, very much. Uh, has declared his support for Israel uh, and that's so welcome because it's the biggest nation in the world, biggest uh, nation in terms of its military power and all the other things that go along with it. Having support from the US is really, really important. But of course, the problem is that you get a whole bunch of different reasons why 
uh, individual European nations uh, don't support uh, Israel more when they should. And a lot of it's down to victimhood. Uh, the Palestinians play the victim card, despite the fact that every set of circumstances that have taken place since uh, 1947 is down to them. They're victims because they wanted their people to be victims when, before the Palestinians existed, they were Arabs. And they didn't help the situation because they didn't want to take in the refugees from the 1948 war that they created. They didn't want there to be a settlement because they want to prolong this war with Israel. And so therefore, uh, we have that victimhood status uh, and a lot of European nations fall into that trap. But tell me, let me tell you one other thing. We, we've discussed many things before, Simon. The United Nations, more than half the nations that, which comprise the United Nations are not democracies. They're the same type of people like Hamas. They are dictatorships. They control their people. They don't allow them to have freedom. So therefore, why would they want to get behind a nation like Israel, which despite all the challenges of conventional and asymmetric warfare it's faced over the last 70 years, is still there, alive, kicking well, and, was, and is going absolutely nowhere. So the United Nations itself uh, is hamstrung by nations within it who do not want to celebrate democracy, who don't want to, uh, uh, to support nations like Israel, and that's where the problem lies. The problem we have is you take away the UN, and what international force do you have? Zero, and that's the dilemma that we're going to have to face at some point in the future. And if we have more people like the President of the United States bringing these issues to the table, then hopefully we can see some progress there. Absolutely. Uh, and what sort of um, response are you expecting from our elected representatives in Parliament over the use of human shields and deliberately putting children and women in the line of fire? Well, we're putting them in the spot, Simon, because if you look at the events of last year at, in, at the Gaza border, on the 14th of May, you'll recall that 62 people were killed at the Gaza border. Any loss of life is tragic. But on the 15th of May, Emily Thornberry, the shadow foreign secretary from the Labour Party, uh, put an urgent question in the House and stood up and condemned Israel. She, she said that the IDF had slaughtered uh, children and civilians, and that language was frequently used uh, in that debate in the House of Commons. A day after that debate took place, we discovered that 52 of the people who were killed, sorry, 53 of the people who were killed on the 14th of May were members of Islamic Jihad or Hamas. That, that those were the facts. I wrote to all 41 people, members of parliament who had criticised the IDF in Israel on the 15th of May and I said to them, you know, when you apologise and correct the record in Hansard uh, in order that uh, you properly record the events of that day and that Israel was under threat and that these people were trying to break the border fence in order to get to Isra innocent Israelis behind that fence. Answer, I have heard none. And that's why we're mounting this campaign. Because these people have got to be told that isn't just about the narrative they, they want uh, to comment on when it suits them. They have to comment on the facts. And the facts on the ground are that Israel faces these types of attacks, this asymmetric warfare all the time. It protects not only its innocent civilians and children, it actually tries to protect the people who live in Gaza from themselves, from their leaders. And so I would hope that when we place these facts, the testimony of groups like My Truth in front of them, then we're going to force them and compel them to look at the truth rather than just reporting the issues that they would uh, rather focus on. And if you looked at the video which we have just seen on the screen there, Jeremy Corbyn, Richard Burden, Andrew Slaughter, Debbie Abrahams, Lisa Nandy, these are all people who have made outrageous slurs against the IDF and how it operates. They have to be brought to book and their constituents will keep on reminding them that every, side has two, every story has two sides and they have to recognise the truth and what's actually happening on the ground in this part of our world. So let's have a look now and uh, remind ourselves of the uh, history of Hamas and its uh, cooperation with the Palestinian Authority. Hamas was founded during the first Palestinian Intifada uprising in 1987, stemming from the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. The aim stated in its founding charter was to liberate Palestine from Israeli occupation and to establish an Islamic state in place of Israel. Hamas, meaning enthusiasm, is an acronym for Islamic resistance movement. The Islamist principles of one of its founders, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, differed starkly from the secular nature of Fatah, the party led by Yasser Arafat, in that Hamas would not tolerate sharing land. 
When the leader of Fatah and the affiliated Palestinian Liberation Organization, Yasser Arafat, signed the Oslo Accords with the Israelis in 1993 under American auspices, Hamas rejected them because it did not recognize Israel's right to exist in Palestine. The second intifada raged from 2000 to 2005. The Palestinian Authority, or PA, held by Fatah, gained stature politically while its rival for power, Hamas, stepped up attacks against Israel. When Arafat died in 2004, the peace process was in a complete stall. Then Hamas changed strategy, deciding to take part in political institutions which it had earlier shunned. Hamas won a decisive majority in Palestinian parliamentary elections in 2006. PA President Mahmoud Abbas was obliged to form a national unity government headed by Prime Minister Ismail Haniyeh of Hamas. But with a Hamas-led administration in place, the US and EU stopped financial assistance. Pro-Hamas and pro-Fatah militias fought each other street to street, each side accusing the other of either corruption or intransigence. Hamas prevailed in Gaza, Fatah in the West Bank. Israel and Egypt economically blockaded Gaza. The territories of the West Bank, with two and a half million Palestinians, and Gaza, with a million and a half, have not only been geographically distanced from each other, but politically divided. Hamas rocket fire was followed by Israel's attack on Gaza in 2009. Abbas's drive to win UN recognition for Palestinian statehood brought a hamas fatah reconciliation agreement last year in the interest of proceeding together with some semblance of unity ahead of national elections supposed to take place this year. While Hamas remains listed as a terrorist organization by the EU, the US and many Western governments, Mahmoud Abbas and Hamas chief Khaled Mehal have been increasing their joint efforts to improve prospects for Palestinians irrespective of any ideological differences. And uh, that news item is a few years old, but it's still very much relevant. Uh, we have to talk, really, not only do Hamas use uh, women and children as human shields, put them directly in the line of fire deliberately, um, and actually want a large number of uh, uh, civilian casualties, but they also fire their rocket and missiles from built-up urban areas with high population. Uh, they fire their rockets and missiles from schools, uh, from mosques and, and hospitals as well, and even fire them from ambulances as well. Um, is there no moral code whatsoever when it comes to the use of firing rockets and missiles at Israel um, used by Hamas? There is no moral code, sadly. Uh, and during Operation Protective Edge, uh, after it took place, I, I, I was a member of Parliament at the time and I remember getting a briefing after it took place uh, and we actually saw all the rocket launching sites that Hamas had used during the campaign. And it was clearly uh, available from the evidence that the places that were being used were schools, hospitals, uh, all the places you would expect that uh, armed conflict would be taken away from, uh, then the terrorists were using those sites as a rocket launch pads in order, in order that they could then expect to get return fire from the IDF who'd be able to coordinate uh, using the technology that they have available to them, available to them exactly where the fire came from, and then make a counter-attack. And they deliberately did that in order that they would put uh, people in danger. But there's another part of it, Simon, which is even more extraordinary. They've actually been caught lifting cadavers that have been killed in a different part of the battle and placing them beside schools and hospitals to give the impression when the IDF have went out of its way to prevent any casualties in those areas and they've thought, we can't do it because it's just too close to that building and there may be innocent people there. They've actually brought cadavers to the place where the IDF haven't struck in order to suggest that the IDF have struck. We've also seen the situations in the video that you saw that we made earlier where Hamas fighters will pick up children to run across the road to use them as protection from fire. You know, you know there, are, there are no moral standards when it comes to these individuals. And that's why we have to expose those members of parliament who say nothing, make no criticism whatsoever of the individuals that, and the groups that like Hamas that use these tactics, but are willing to slur and slander and libel the probably the most moral army on the planet in the shape of the IDF. Absolutely. Uh, and we know that uh, Hamas uh, took power in Gaza in 2007 after a coup against the ruling 
Palestinian Authority run by uh, Fatah, and we saw that Fatah members were chucked off the roof. And ever since then, we've seen that Hamas has established um, a, a totalitarian uh, regime. But what has been the legacy of uh, Hamas's rule of Gaza? Well, you know, well, you know, what you have to remember is that the reason that people voted for Hamas rather than Fatah is because the people saw Fatah be, as being a completely corrupt organisation. And it was a completely, and is a completely corrupt organisation. You won't find Abu Maza uh, living in a, in, in a small uh, flat or living in penury uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the West Bank, aka Judea and Samaria. You'll find him in a massive palace, something that I visited. He's got a very, I think I mentioned it before, a very slick uh, media operation when anyone visits him uh, in terms of making sure that they go away with a favourable favor, impression of him. But the situation is this. If you want to look at the bigger picture about what's happening in the Middle East, and you hear about the West Bank often, viewers should remember that between 1948 and 1967, Israel did not occupy the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. There were no, inverted commas, settlements. But all the Arab nations still wanted to destroy Israel. The whole idea of settlements, it's just a, it's, it's been created to create another piece of injustice that the Arabs want to tell the international community about how, how, vic how big victims they are and, and how poorly they've been treated, when in fact they created the circumstances themselves. So, you know, that's what changed in 1967 when Israel had to go in to take that territory to protect itself from the threats it faced. But how does it connect to Gaza? Because Israel after huge pressure from the international community, left Gaza. I remember the pictures on the TV, and many of your viewers will as well, where Israelis were being dragged out of Gaza by the IDF, by the, let me say that again, the Israel Defense Force, being dragged out of Gaza. And the reason that Israel isn't going to be dragging anyone out of the West Bank, there's no reason why, in a Palestinian state, if one was ever formed in the future, that it should be Juden free. Absolutely. Uh, Jews should be entitled to live if there was a state of Palestine there, just in the same way as the 20% of the Israeli population is Arab as well. And this is another question that has to be put to our populations. But Israel will not allow the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, to become another Gaza, because that means they would face rocket attacks on the southern flank, and they would also face the attacks from the West Bank where people would be allowed to be armed. And that's why Benjamin Netanyahu has made it absolutely clear that there cannot be a settlement without Israel's security interests being taken care of. And the, this is crucial, really important point, and I'll finish on this, Simon. The days when the Palestinians can make demands are over. They had the chance when they were offered a state in 1937 via the Peel Commission and 1947 via the United Nations. If you keep on, if you are constantly in the losing end of battles because you keep on choosing the wrong battles, then you deserve to face the consequences of those decisions and those mistakes. Absolutely. So let's uh, remind ourselves of the uh, legacy of Hamas ever since they took power in uh, that coup d'etat in uh, 2007. As the ruling government in Gaza, it's Hamas's duty to take care of the citizens of Gaza. In the last 10 years that Hamas has been in power in the Gaza Strip, they've made a few key improvements. The first is the economy. 67% of Hamas's entire Gaza budget is spent on the military wing of the organization. Since 2014, Hamas has spent more than $120 million on terror tunnels. This was money that Hamas could have used for civilian purposes to improve life in Gaza. Instead, the money is going to terror. This leads us to improvement number two infrastructure. Hamas has been hard at work investing large amounts of resources into building the terror tunnel network under the Gaza Strip. To build this network, Hamas has been using construction material, cement, and other valuable resources that could have gone to build schools, homes, businesses, and mosques. Hamas has built these tunnels to infiltrate Israeli communities. This brings us to area number three, suppression. Hamas is not a big fan of freedom of speech or expression and actively quashes dissent. Hamas monitors posts, articles, and tweets written by Palestinians and arrests and tortures critics. Hamas's political rivals are subject to torture and often, after confessing, are publicly executed. 
With developments like these, it's clear that Hamas is doing everything possible to make the Gaza Strip an open and free society for all of its citizens. Or are they? Throughout Operation Protective Edge, Palestinian civilians and infrastructure were harmed in populated areas. Why? Hamas knew that the IDF would return fire to these areas if Israelis were being shot at, and yet, it did it anyway. Why? Hamas knew that booby-trapping civilian homes would lead to serious damage, and yet, it did it anyway. Why? Hamas knew that the IDF would destroy the tunnels of death that it built under civilian homes, and yet, it did it anyway. Why? Hamas always knew the consequences of its actions. Not only did it neglect its responsibility for the people of Gaza, time and again, it turned them into human shields for its terror activity. Why? أعتقد إنه أن يتعرض الناس وأن يواجهوا الطيران العسكري الإسرائيلي بصدور عارية ليحموا بيوتهم أعتقد إنه هذه سياسة أثبتت نجاعتها في مواجهة الاحتلال. Hamas thrives on violence, pain, death, and destruction, both Israeli and Palestinian. As more people die in Israel, Hamas gains popularity in Gaza. As more people die in Gaza. Hamas gains legitimacy in the world. In the eyes of Hamas, the residents of Gaza are not human beings. They are no more than human shields. That's why. And uh, sadly, it's the uh, brave soldiers of the IDF who have to go up against um, Hamas and their shocking uh, tactics uh, of terror. Um, one thing um, we have to discuss really when we're discussing Hamas is not only their kind of use of human shields using uh, and deliberately putting women, children in harm's way, it's also the incredible damage that these rockets and, and, and missiles cause um, when they're fired from, from the Gaza Strip. Um, and uh, we've, we've seen that uh, towns like Storot are, apt, are, are devastated towns. They've got problems with um, you know, huge psychological problems because of these rockets and missiles. Um, can you explain to some of our viewers and also our MPs need to know what it would be like to live under that barrage of rockets and missiles fired by Hamas that, that southern Israeli towns and villages face um, every now and again? Well, I can tell you something that I didn't know until recently, until the weekend, actually, Simon, when an Israeli friend was visiting me, and it's this, that uh, since point in time, then it's now law that every new property that's built has a safe room attached to it, a place where people can go uh, when there's a rocket attack. And it's not, it's not just in Starot, <coughs> excuse me, and in places which are close to the border, it's in Tel Aviv. All new homes have to have these facilities beside them. So that's the first thing. You, when you buy a property, you think we'll be thinking about well, how many bedrooms do we need? Are we upsize and are we downsize? And we're going to are we having a family or are we have we had the family have all grown up and have moved on? It's all those types of decisions. In Israel, you've got to create. There's got to be a, a safe room where if there is a rocket attack, uh, people can be protected as much as they can be in no circumstances. So that's the type of real problems that people face in Stirot as you will know, uh, having visited there as well, you've got 17 seconds to take cover. And who knows the psychological effects it has on the, the young people, the babies, the children who are grabbed running down the street with hysterical mothers and fathers trying to get to a shelter when the siren sounds off and they know that there's an imminent rocket attack. All these things are taking place, and of course there's the cost of rebuilding, and we know that Israel has to spend a disproportionate amount of money on its defence and on its rebuilding. But let me tell you the other side. When the rockets are fired back by Israel to blow up targets uh, in Gaza, then there's another problem, because the money that we spend in aid that goes from our country uh, to places like Gaza, and it goes from the European, European Union to Gaza, these monies are spent to be able to build up infrastructure, to build up 
uh, a society where people have changed the same way as we have in our country for food supplies and all that, all the things that are necessary to live in a, a modern life. And all these things have been blown up. And then the Palestinians, the Hamas and Fatah, demand money to rebuild them again. Only for us to know that at some point in the, future, in the near future, the, the high prospects are they're going to get blown up again. I had this debate in the House of Commons in 2014 with a person that everybody will know, Jeremy Corbyn, when he asked that precise question because, of course, he had his bleeding heart out for the terrorists uh, when that debate took place in the, House, in the House of Commons. And I responded to him by saying this, what is the point of us constantly pumping in British UK aid money to places like Gaza when the people who live there, the political leaders of Hamas, don't care about the money, of the hard-earned money of British taxpayers? All they're interested in is their vision of destroying Israel. And they don't care how much physical damage, how much infrastructure damage is caused. So there's cost on both sides, but the only difference is the terrorists aren't picking up the tab for any of it. No, of course, and also I think we have to make a, a very important point is that it's not only the IDF that has to face with these uh, terror tactics used by Islamist terrorist organisations like Hamas. Um, the British Army's had to face the same thing um, in Iraq and also in Afghanistan as well as American forces. Um, whenever they go against a, a, a terrorist organisation, even ISIS used the same tactics as well. So, you know, this is something that actually endangers uh, Western military forces because they deliberately put women and children in, in harm's way in order to maximise media coverage that brings condemnation on our Western forces so that we can't actually take out and destroy these terror organisations. How important is it that our members of parliament really understand this, not only for Israel's security and protection, uh, but also for Britain's security and protection? Well, that's why I think it was really prescient that the, some of the clips that you've shown and in the clips that we've created for our campaign video contains the testimony of Colonel Richard Kemp because he knows that those tactics have been used in uh, theatres where British troops have been involved and he knows the dangers, he knows all the tactics and he himself says that they're even worse in terms of what IDF has to face in relation to Hamas. So therefore, I think it's important that, uh, that the MPs through the campaign we're just about to run understand the challenges that Israel has faced, does face, and will face in the future. And we have to keep on drilling that message home. And every time someone like Emily Thornberry uh, wants, or Andrew Slaughter or Jeremy Corby wants to immediately reach to the defence of the terrorist, then we make sure that they know the truth and that has been put forward in the proper way to politicians through their constituents. And that's why it's so important. They don't, the politicians, the 650 MPs, don't need to listen to Michael McCann or Simon Barrett, but they do need to listen to their constituents. I've got a constituency MP the same as everyone else. I'll make sure my voice is heard, and that's why it's important why how Revelation TVers have to make sure that their voices are heard too. Excellent. So let's have a look at the man himself, uh, Colonel uh, Richard Kemp, talking about the dilemmas that Israel faces in confronting Hamas and their use of asymmetrical warfare. There are two views of the Israeli military, what you hear in most of the media and the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth. I was the commander of British forces in Afghanistan. I have fought in combat zones around the world, including Northern Ireland, Bosnia, Macedonia and Iraq. I was also present throughout the conflict in Gaza in 2014. Based on my experience and on my observations, the Israel Defence Force, the IDF, does more to safeguard the rights of civilians in a combat zone than any other army in the history of warfare. Why is this so? Firstly, Israel is a decent country with Western values run on democratic principles. Israel has no more interest in war than Belgium does. In fact, Israel has never started a war. The only reason it ever goes to war is to defend itself. And it has to defend itself because unlike Belgium, it is surrounded by countries and armed groups that want to destroy it. Secondly, Judaism, with its unsurpassed moral standards, remains a major influence on the citizens of Israel. I say this as a non-Jew. Thirdly, the army is composed overwhelmingly of citizen soldiers. Israel's a small country with a small professional army. To fight a war, it depends on its conscripts and its reservists. These are ordinary citizens, from professors to plumbers, 
called upon to defend their homes. They don't want to be fighting, and they don't want to harm others. Nowhere was the essential morality and decency of the IDF more evident than in the Gaza War of 2014. If ever there was a purely defensive war, this was it. The war was started by Hamas, the terror organization, designated as such by the US State Department that runs the Gaza Strip. In the first six months of 2014, Hamas launched hundreds of rockets at Israeli civilians. After repeated warnings from Israel to stop, the Israeli Air Force finally conducted precision strikes to halt the rocket fire. And the IDF advanced into Gaza to destroy a network of terror tunnels that Hamas had constructed to attack Israeli communities near the Gaza border. The IDF took extraordinary measures to give Gaza civilians notice of targeted areas, dropping millions of leaflets, broadcasting radio messages, sending texts, and making tens of thousands of phone calls. Let me repeat that. The Israelis called Gazans on their cell phones and told them to leave their residences and move to safety. Never in the history of warfare has an army phoned its enemy and told them where they're going to drop their bombs. Many IDF missions that could have taken out Hamas military capabilities were aborted to prevent civilian casualties, increasing the risk to Israeli citizens and soldiers. Despite all of this, of course innocent civilians were killed. Every war is chaotic and confusing, and mistakes are frequent. But mistakes are not war crimes. Hamas, on the other hand, committed war crimes as official government policy. Hamas deliberately positioned its military assets among the civilian population, hiding weapons in schools and hospitals, and placing rocket launchers alongside apartment buildings, then forced those civilians to stay in areas they knew would be attacked. They also instructed their people to report the lie that every Gazan killed was a civilian, even if they were actually fighters. And if there were no civilian deaths, Hamas made them up. Numerous internet sites show Palestinians elaborately staging sniper victims and smashed ambulances, among other phony horrors. It's so common, there's even a term for it, Pallywood, as in Palestinian Hollywood. Ironically, it's the leaders of Hamas themselves who best understand the extraordinary measures the IDF will take to protect innocent civilians. They take full advantage of Israel's decency and adherence to the laws of war. No army takes such risks in order to protect civilians as the Israeli army does. I say this as a professional soldier. I say it because it's true and people who care about truth should know it. I'm Colonel Richard Kemp for Prager University. And it's always been a pleasure to have uh, Colonel Richard Kemp on the Middle East Report and uh, the courageous and brave work he's doing in telling the truth about Israel's cause and particularly the high moral standards and code of ethics that the IDF have. Um, and, and that's something that we, we need to, to think as well. I mean, when you look at the Israeli army, uh, most of those fighting and serving for the, uh, the IDF are men and young women from the age of 17 to 19 or 21. Huge great responsibilities on their shoulders. Um, they don't want to be soldiers. They don't want to take up arms and weapons. And because of Israel's security situation, they have to. Uh, and they do a tremendous job in defending and protecting um, Israel. Um, and they value life and love life, which is the complete difference between uh, the IDF and uh, Hamas. So really, how moral are the IDF? I don't think you can get any, there is any other fighting force in the world that operates under the same moral control guidelines as the IDF. It's as simple as that. You know, even 
every army is going to have its problems at some point. You know, the British Army, and particularly over the last number of years, because it's been involved in a lot of different theatres, uh, individual soldiers have been accused of doing different things. Some of, uh, some of it has been found to be completely untrue, uh, and has been... And, in, and we've got a situation at the moment when the soldiers who were involved in the Northern Ireland conflict, uh, you know, who are 70-plus years old, are being asked to account for things that took place many, many years ago. Uh, you know, people who will know the issue better than me will be able to make better judgments than that, but... I, Quite frankly, I don't think you can ask people to serve uh, and to put their lives in the line and then years later uh, be asked to account for things that took place on a certain day uh, decades ago. Uh, the IDF faces a huge amount of scrutiny. We have social media, we have fake news, we have news outlets that are deliberately setting out to undermine the only democracy in the Middle East. And that's why I would very strongly argue, Simon, that we have to stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, with ordinary Israelis and the members of the IDF, because they have the same moral standards and principles that we have. They love life. Uh, they believe that every human being has a right to exist. They will go to extraordinary lengths uh, to protect life, even to the extent that they put their own lives in danger. I can't, you know, greater love have no man than laying down his life for a friend. These people not only lay their, their lives down for their friends and their fellow citizens, they're prepared to, their morals allow them to put their lives in danger potentially for their enemy. My goodness, what an extraordinary fighting force. Uh, and um, Michael, we want to see the end of the occupation in Gaza, don't we? And uh, the occupation by Hamas and the uh, horrendous, oppressive regime that is Hamas. Absolutely. I want ordinary people who live in Gaza to have great lives. I want their children to grow up and to have uh, the same uh, outlook as the children of the UK and any other country in the world. And one thing I do remember as a politician, I don't say this very often, uh, and I, but I always said that when I was a politician, you want the next generation to do better than the last one. I look at my children and uh, I look at the opportunities they have and, I, I'm de I, and I'm delighted that they have achieved that by doing better than their mother and father have done. But what about a child being born in Gaza today or indeed a teenager in Gaza today? What outlook do they have? They don't have any outlook because they're under the yoke, under the hammer of Hamas, a terrorist organisation which, which believes that it doesn't matter how many decades, how many centuries pass, they will never recognise Israel. And ultimately, this is where the key of how to end this, uh, where, where that key lies. It lies in the ordinary Gazans saying to Hamas, enough is enough. We're not prepared to live in this horrible society anymore that you've created. We're not prepared to put our children in the firing line. And you know something? I'm confident that one day the Gazans uh, might find a leader who'll be brave, brave enough to put forward that agenda. Uh, Michael, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest today. Uh, you know my, you have my complete support for your latest campaign. Um, and I wish you every success with that. And may God be with you. And uh, thank you for being my guest on today's Middle East Report. You're welcome, Sam. It's a pleasure. And I just want to thank you for watching the Middle East Report today. It's absolutely essential that we stand for truth. And that truth is that Hamas use women and children as human shields and deliberately put them in the line of fire. That's why it's so important that our, our elected representatives in Parliament understand this truth and this reality and get behind and support the IDF. So I want to thank you today for watching the Middle East Report, and I leave you with this wonderful song in tribute to the brave and courageous soldiers of the IDF fighting and defending the one and only Jewish state of Israel. Yeah.